Well, good morning. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 127, starting in verse 3. Scripture says this, Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons born in one's youth. Happy is the man who has filled his quiver with them. I'm going to invite you to stand this morning, and we're going to sing about our Creator God, all creatures of our God and King, Hymn 11. Let's sing this morning. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. visiting, we are certainly honored by having you present today. Uh, we count that a great privilege that you've chosen to come and worship with the First Baptist family. And that's what we're here to do, to worship our, our Lord, our God, our King. And uh, so it's a great privilege uh, to have you with us. I was told at the beginning of the service that we have a, a dignitary in the audience today. I hear that the Queen of England is visiting with us today. Uh, I just kind of heard the story. I didn't put it all together, but one of our little ones, uh, the Sutherland's granddaughter, man, you talk about getting a brag about your grandchildren, but she dressed up like the Queen of England at Halloween and somehow got a response from the Queen of England. Now, how many of you have ever gotten a response from the Queen of England? Or the president, I mean, that is pretty amazing. So what, what a story. Uh, just, I gotta hear more about this, but that's quite a story. And, uh, but then we also have, you know, a few weeks ago, we celebrated uh, Nash and Jody, uh, who are engaged now. <coughs> but something happened, I think, the last couple of days. Wade, what, what in the world did you do <laughs> the last few days? Did you ask her to marry you? <laughs> Amen. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, I assume that you said yes? Good. All right. So praise the Lord. So pray for this couple. Pray for these young couples as they are uh, getting engaged and uh, wedding bells are ringing. So we are glad of that. So we're glad you're here. And uh, so we're going to take a moment to pray. And I'm going to ask you to do what I asked early service to do. If you've got a Something on your heart and mine uh, that, you know, how many times do we promise people I'll pray for you and then we forget? So why don't you do that right now? If there's a person or something you said, I'll pray, I'll pray about it, then do it right now. Just take it to the Lord. If there's something troubling you, uh, you need to give it to the Lord. Whatever it is, just, just give it to God. He's a good shepherd. He, he can handle it. It doesn't depend on you. He's the one that takes care of you. And so let him cast your cares upon him this morning. So as we pray, let's take a moment to do those things.
Our Father, as we bow here this morning, we're here to worship you. We worship you, Lord. We want to worship you in spirit. We want it to be real. We want it to be because we have a relationship with Christ and that we realize without a relationship with Christ, we cannot worship you. And so I pray that we are here worshiping you and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, Father, we want to do it in truth. We don't want this to be a, just an experiential thing. It's not all about emotions and feelings. It's that we worship properly. We worship rightly. And we desire to do that. We thank you that you give us parameters. You've given us a word that is clear and sure. We want to honor you today, Lord, by honoring your word. We pray that you'll bless the, very, the many prayer requests that have been mentioned right now. Certain needs of persons, family members, decisions, worrisome things that have been on our mind. We just give those to you. Father, we pray that as we think about where we are today, this, this day, as we deal, with, we deal with your word, a matter that should not even be a matter of a debate among believers. We come to the matter of life sanctity of life, the giving of life that comes from you. Help us, Lord, as we deal with being reminded of the giver of life, the sacredness of it, the separateness of human life. We pray for our nation, Lord, to think we've gone 49 years doing what we do to babies. Forgive us, God. Have mercy upon us. Help our Supreme Court to stand and do what is right. Please, God, give them the courage to overturn a decision that was made 49 years ago. And we pray that the states across our nation would take a stand to say life is sacred. We have no right to say that we can take the life of the innocent babies. Help us as we worship. Help us as we examine your word on this matter of life that has ramifications all across uh, our lives, our world, our nation. Help us to see how this is the bedrock of most everything else that we do and believe, stand for. So bless this time of worship today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand once again. We're going to sing him 48. I sing the mighty power of God. There's 
praise, exalt, and glorify the King of Heaven. We are here this morning to sing praise to our Creator God. So let's sing Him one. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. If you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 18, that's where we will be this morning in our scripture reading. Matthew chapter 18. We're going to go over the first six verses. Hear the Lord this morning. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened to his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. This is the word of the Lord this morning. We can see that Jesus um, has a special heart for children. And we see that in verse, also if we would look at verse 14, it reads this. As Jesus is teaching on this parable of the lost sheep, at the end of it, he says this in verse 14. So it is not the will of the, my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. We see Jesus, he definitely has a special heart for these little ones. And if Jesus has a heart for them, so should we. And so let's have the heart of Jesus. Let's not let one little one perish if it be our will. Let's continue worship.
have your Bibles this morning. If you'd like to join me, uh, our passage is Psalm 139. Chuck uh, was good to open our service with that passage, and that's where we're going to make our way back this morning. As we begin, I want to ask you a question here. How did, how did you become a Christian? Did, uh, did someone witness to you? Or did you hear a sermon? Somebody was teaching something or they preached a sermon about how to become a believer, and how to become a Christian, or maybe it was a family member, they shared the gospel with you. You know the gospel is found uh, in the Bible. You were saved, and that means faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. So you had to believe something. You had to hear something. And what you heard was what? The Bible. You heard the Word of God. Are you sure you're saved? What are you basing it on? Well, I hope you'll say to me, I, I know I'm saved because I'm basing it on the Word of God. Not my feelings, not emotions. I'm basing it on God's Word. God said that I can be saved. He showed me how to be saved. Now, the only, the only foundation you have to back up your salvation is a written Word. The Bible. You're basing your salvation on the Bible. Not an experience, not an emotion, not a feeling. That, that's, not, that's not the foundation for our, for our salvation. I would hope every one of us that is a Christian will say, Brother Brad, I know that I'm saved, and I base it on the fact of the promises God made me in His Word. I'm basing it on the promises of God's Word. That will never change. That will never fail. I, I stand upon the word of God. That is the basis of my salvation. That it tells me Jesus died for me on the cross. I by faith put my trust in him. But the only reason I know of that act is because the Bible tells me this. It tells me what I must do. It tells me uh, what I must believe. It tells me what Christ has done. And so therefore I have a sure foundation. The Bible. Okay. So we're starting on this premise. You're basing your salvation on the finished work of Christ. And the reason we know the finished work of Christ is a reality is because we have a book that tells us it happened. It's a book. It's a living book. It's the Word of God, unlike any other book. Today we're going to take that same book and examine a subject matter that is very controversial. It's a subject matter that I made a commitment when I started pastoring over 30 years ago that I will touch on this matter 
no matter if it's acceptable or not, no matter if it's seen as being political. I find it interesting. A lot of times I'll preach on things and people will say, you're, you're so political. And here's what I find. If the Bible speaks to it, it's not political, it's biblical. And that's where we are today. Now, the same people that would say, hallelujah, I base my salvation on the Word of God, will turn their ears to what the Word of God says about a subject matter like we're going to deal with today. And Christians are doing that by the droves. They're turning their eyes away from the Scriptures when it deals with this. But, oh, no, I believe the Bible when it comes to what it says about being saved because I sure want to go to heaven. But what you're saying today then I'm going to have a take-it-or-leave-it attitude. And you can't do that. That's not consistent. If the Bible is not accurate on what we're going to talk about today, then it's not accurate on your salvation, and you don't know if you're going to heaven. But we know we are, and we have a more sure word. Today I speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. This is not a subject matter. It's not a sermon that I really look forward to. All week I have dreaded this sermon. It's not the kind of sermon that will lead us to say hallelujah and oh, that feels good. You're not going to leave here today after this sermon feeling good. I hope you don't feel good. I hope you feel bad. I hope you feel grieved. I hope you feel burdened. This is the subject matter that we have before us today. In Psalm 139, David is describing something unique and sacred. And it's called human life. He says, you formed me, my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and my soul knows this very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was, in, I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet un, unformed, and in your book they are all written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there was None of them. January the 22nd, let me emphasize, I married a couple on January the 22nd one time, and I made a statement that January the 22nd will go down as the darkest day in American history. And that couple said, Brother Brad, could you not say it like that? <laughs> we got married on that date. Let me say it this way. January the 22nd, 1973, if you were married on that date, I'm sorry, okay? But that will go down as the darkest day in American history. Because on that day, abortion on demand was, in, was legalized the entire nine months of pregnancy. The Bible teaches that the legalizing of killing innocent flesh and blood created in the human, humans created in the image of God is sinful. There's no other option to this matter. We have many passages we can study. We could talk about the sacredness of life, sanctity of life. We could see that God is the creator of life. Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it in superabundance. God is about life. God is about life. He didn't intend for man to be in a fallen condition. He put man in a perfect garden, a perfect environment, perfect body, and man rebelled against God and death came into the world and darkness came into the world. God is the God of light. God is good. God is holy. But we see what man in all of his cunning devices has done to that which God has created. And you say, is abortion really that necessary to talk about? Is it something we really ought to stake so much on? Should we be a one-issue voting block in our society? Because that's what the world says is wrong, that we shouldn't just vote on the matter of one issue. Even those in the Christian world and theological world are even coming and saying, for some unknown reason, some weird reason, I don't understand, some that one time I respected greatly, uh, that now I have no respect for, that basically said abortion should not be the deciding factor on who you vote for and who you vote against. And I would say, yes, it is. If this issue is not something that ought to be taken to that level, then I don't know of anything else that's important to worry about in this world. If you get it wrong on the matter of life, you're going to get it wrong on everything. If we get it wrong on the sanctity and separateness of life, especially when it comes to a baby that is so precious, though it does have a sin nature, when you look at a newborn baby, what do you think? You don't think about, oh, evil, dark, wickedness. You think of preciousness. You think of sweetness. You think of beauty, you think of miracles, you think of the joy. And if we can take something like that and do what we do to it in our society, then we're going to get it wrong on everything else. 
If we can't stand in defense of the life of a child that, has been, that is in the womb, and sadly even out of the womb, we're not going to have much respect for life once it gets to be an, at an age where it does not seem to be viable and really contributing to society. We're not going to have much emphasis on life of one who comes into this world as a Down syndrome or mentally handicapped or physically handicapped. We're not going to have great respect for that life because really they don't live up to the level and standard that we deem is necessary if we can take the life of a baby. We're not going to get it right in the matter of the sexes that exist today. You wonder why there's such a a huge explosion of those who now they don't know if they're a boy or a girl and girls want to be boys and boys want to be girls and you women would say why in the world does a boy want to be a woman and then there are men that are saying well, why would a woman want to be a man God made us a certain way but we have this explosion of I don't know if I'm trans or if I'm I'm homo or I'm a lesbian or I'm bi or I'm this or that and there is this just total chaos and it all started around this realm of un or dis uh, understanding the sanctity of life. Having the wrong view of the sanctity of life. Recognizing that God is the one who gives life. Yes, when we get it wrong on the matter of abortion, we will get it wrong on everything else in the moral realm of our society because we do not value life. When we look at this passage of Scripture, David reveals to us the uniqueness of the womb. He said, you have formed my inward parts. This is a Hebrew word that means you possess me. The Hebrew word here is literally kidneys. He said, you form my kidneys. He's saying, you form my organs. You form my internal organs, God. Then he said, you covered me in my mother's womb. The word here means you have sewn me together. You've knitted me together. What did he knit together? Well, the organs, and then also his frame. Verse 15, my frame, my skeletal bones, my bones. You have put my substance together. God was involved in the creating of not only the organs within the body, but the bones that protect those organs. He said, you, I was made in secret. This is a picturesque way of describing the womb of a mother. As far as I know, the only people that have wombs are women, right? So these men that are saying they're pregnant and having babies... That's the most foolish statement that I think a human being can make. But in the darkness of the womb, that baby is being embroidered by God. It's being sewn together. He said, you have curiously wrought me. You have embroidered me in the lowest parts of the earth. Again, speaking of that, the darkness of the womb. And then verse 16, he says, you saw my substance being yet unformed, unperfect. This is a reference to the embryonic stage of, of a baby. It affirmed that God knew David from pre-embryonic stage all the way to death. Isaiah 49, 5 says, And now says the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. You see, Isaiah realized that God had a plan for his life even from conception. In Job 10, 11, Job says, You have clothed me with skin and flesh. You fenced me up with bones and sinews. Job is declaring that he was a person while he was in the womb, and God is the warm one who formed his physical body. In Jeremiah 1, 5, Jeremiah said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you, and before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you, I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Several generations before Jeremiah ever came on the scene, God had already called him and set him aside to be a prophet. Psalm 51, 5, which is oftentimes a very debated verse and people question exactly what it means, says this, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Some have said, oh, that verse is saying that to have an encounter with a person of the opposite sex, your husband or wife, in the sight of God is sinful. That's not what the verse says at all. When you compare it with other scriptures, especially when the Bible says that the marriage bed is undefiled before God and holy. When you study one of the Old Testament books of the Bible that my dear wife loves, she loves it when I do a series on this entitled The Song of Solomon. Go to The Song of Solomon, folks. Read that book. You'll get God's view of the intimacy of marriage and what a high prize that he puts upon it. 
That's not what this verse is talking about. It's not saying that having physical relationship with your husband or wife is sinful. David is saying that the moment I was conceived, I received a sin nature. He realized it was not his choice. It was something that he gained because Adam and Eve made a decision to rebel against God and it was passed on to him. But here's the uniqueness about that verse. What has sin natures? What has a sin nature? Do plants have sin natures? No, they do not. Do animals have sin natures? No, they do not. The only thing that has a sin nature is a living soul, a human soul. And David is saying that the moment I was conceived, I had a sin nature. You say, what's the big deal about that? We have been told in the early days of the abortion industry that that which was in the womb is not really a human being. A Nobel Peace Prize winning scientists said that we really shouldn't even call a baby a human being until they've been in the world three days. I mean, that means if you want to get rid of it on day one, day two, better hurry because day three we're going to finally say, yeah, that's, I believe that's a human being. Now we look in the womb with pictures, we take videos, we look at these little babies and their little faces are all squunched up, you know. You people put it on Facebook and say, oh, isn't that precious? And I'm looking at it saying, oh my gosh, is that from Mars or is that a baby. Now, I'm not just talking about your baby. I'm talking about mine, my grandkids. I saw the first time one of my grandsons, they sent me that. They said, isn't that beautiful? And I'm like, oh no, oh no, it's something wrong. We need to call for prayer meeting. You know, something doesn't look right. That, you know, it's amazing what we can see, but it's still just not, you know, clear as when they come on out here into the world. But we recognize that's a human being and it's a human being because the Bible says that he is because that particular substance has a sin nature. You see, there is no qualitative difference from the moment of conception to birth. The only difference is quantitative. Everything about the genetic structure and personality is determined at conception. The only difference between a child at conception and a child that's born nine months later is nine months. Time is the only difference. For 2,000 years that Christianity held sway in the Western world, abortion was considered the most despicable of crimes. It was illegal. If a doctor performed an abortion, their license would be revoked and they would be put in prison. In four weeks, when a mother finds that she is with child, the child has already developed a heart that is beating. Many say that it's just the mother's body and she has a right over her body. Have you heard that one? A woman has a right over her own body. Well, let me tell you something. No woman has two hearts. Even the baby many times has a different blood type. That which is when the woman is not the woman's right. That's not her body. That's another body. That's another living being. That is not her right. When I hear these people stand up before the Supreme Court and say a woman's constitutional right to have an abortion, go study the Constitution. We are so ignorant about history that we don't realize there is nothing in the Constitution that says you have a right to kill a baby. It's not there. In five weeks, ears, eyes, and minute hands are formed. In eight weeks, the features are recognizably human. When we look at the non-biblical view of abortion, it is true that in the Mediterranean basin for over uh, many thousands of years that abortion was practiced except among Christians and Jews. In the Roman Empire, Will Durant says that 99 out of 100 families killed the girl baby after the first one. Any of you a second child, second daughter of the family, third daughter of the family? During the days of Rome, you'd have been killed. Your life was wiped out. You know what I wonder? Where is the women movement? Where's the women movement? These are girls. These are women. These are ladies. These are future women that are being murdered in the womb. Where is the Black Lives Matter group? Where are the critical race theorists? Where are those that say that we need to stamp out racism in our country when if you look at the statistics, though the black community makes up 18% of our, of our country's population, 39% of abortions that are performed in America are done on black women. Do you realize that Margaret Sanger, who's the author and promoter of abortion in the early days, that her main reason that she promoted that was so that black children would be murdered, aborted, in poverty-stricken society? Now, where is that in the news? Where is that at? Where is that right? 
In the 4th century A.D., Christianity won a victory over the Greco-Roman paganism. Abortion was stamped out until the 20th century. It reappeared in Soviet Russia. It then appeared in Nazi Germany. And then it appeared in all of Western Europe. It finally came to the United States of America. And though we started last and started late, we didn't take us long to be number one. <laughs> what a sad indictment on our nation. In 1961, the National Council of Churches, which is a very liberal, liberal group even then, but now even, even more, even made this statement in 1961. They said, Protestant Christians are agreed in condemning abortion. Destruction of life already begun cannot be condoned. But guess what the council did? They departed from the Bible. They said, well, we don't believe the Bible is the Word of God anymore. We don't believe that you should take it literal. We don't believe it's true. We, don't be we believe it may speak to certain things that are good and some things that it's in error. And after they took that stand, they began sanctioning abortion of conscience. Since 1973, the Roe v. Wade decision has resulted in the death of close to 70 to 80 million babies. If you took 30 states in America, added up the population of 30 states in America, it doesn't even come out to that number. What if we woke up this morning and found out that 30 states in America were totally annihilated and every human being living in those 30 states were dead? What kind of shockwave would that send through this country? What kind of shockwave would that send through the world? And that is exactly what we've done when it comes to babies. That means that if you have a child, that one-third of your child's playmates have been killed through abortion. One child is killed every 20 seconds. Three are killed every minute. 180 are killed every hour. 4,320 are killed every day. If you added up all the tragic loss of life and all the world that America has been a part of, from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War all the way to the recent wars, if you added up all of the casualties of all of the wars that have ever happened in the history of America, it doesn't even equal one year of how many babies we kill in America. Now try to wrap your mind around that. Try to wrap our minds around that. Francis Schaeffer said, if the Christian community will not stand on the abortion issue, on the issue of life, then where will it stand? If we will not stand on this, then what will we stand for? If we're not going to stand here, then where? If not now, then when? If not you, then who? And as the clocks are ticking, babies continue to die. They told us in the beginning that if we would allow abortion on demand, that every child would then be a wanted child. Child abuse would completely drop off the scene. Within two years that Roe v. Wade was approved, child abuse rose over 400%. You see, you cannot tell a woman or a man and a woman that you can kill a baby in the womb and not in some subconscious way be telling them it's okay to hurt them when they're outside the womb. If you can kill that precious baby in your womb, then it must not be that bad to hurt them once they are born. You know, it's amazing. Some of our children can't even go to school and take a pill, an aspirin, unless they've gotten a written permission from their parents. The nurse cannot prescribe medicine unless they've been approved by the parents. But many of our youth can go and procure an abortion without even having parental consent. If I went home today, and I would not do this because my wife would kill me first, if I went home and took my cat outside, had all the neighbors to come by and say, hey, everybody come over. We're going to have a, I'm going to do something I want you to see. And I took my cat outside and took my pistol out and blew its brains out. What would happen? Well, Mark Best would probably be called. He'd come and say, Brad, you know, I don't know what's going on with you, but, you know, cruel to the animal is something we don't, we can't allow. But your wife or your child can go and procure an abortion without your consent as a husband or a father or parents. If you don't remember anything else, you need to remember that we have documented scientific test tube proof that babies feel pain in the womb at eight weeks. Do you know that some of the abortion procedures that we've done, they have watched the babies when they have stuck needles in the sac of that womb to inject a salty solution that those babies will move away from that area. They keep moving, trying to get away from the, get away from the needle because they realize that it's painful. They don't want that to hit them. They feel it when their skin, when they hemorrhage and their skin is burning off. Those babies feel it 
When a serrated knife is injected into the womb and their bones are sawed asunder, they feel it, they react to pain. Tragically, men like Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who was the abortion kingpin in the beginning, became so sickened and horrified by what he saw in the abortuary that he finally stopped the practice. He even went on to say, you know, we've falsified a lot of the numbers before they approved it by the Supreme Court. They claimed that thousands and thousands of women were dying in back alley abortions. And he said really less than a hundred had died in back alley abortion for many years. In 1973, the Supreme Court said that a human being was not a person until after they were born. Folks, they were wrong. You know that in 1857, the Supreme Court made a judgment call? See, some people think, well, once the Supreme Court rules on it, it can never be overturned. That's the law of the Medes and the Persian. It's almost the Bible. In 1857, the Supreme Court ruled that black people were not people if they were slaves. How many of y'all agree with that? Not a one of us. It took a civil war in some ways to overturn that, to face that reality. And folks, we need to realize that we're at a, day, a state today that we need to stand up and let our voice be heard to save the Supreme Court again. It is time to overturn a ruling that was wrong in the beginning but had been proven wrong time after time after time. We live in a day where they cannot hide uh, behind uh, evidence. Now we have cameras and pictures that we can literally go in the womb to say this is a human being. I think it was one of our Supreme Court justices during the hearing of late. Was it Sotomayor? The woman's? Who made the statement as they were telling her, do you not realize that those babies in the womb, when they are being touched by these knives, when they're being touched by these needles, they are moving, they are moving, they're alive, they are reacting. And she made, had the gall to say that dead bodies even have a tendency to move after they supposedly are dead. To say, that doesn't prove anything that a, the baby's moving away. That's our Supreme Court justice. That's supposed to be some of the brightest of the bright that's making a moronic statement to defend the killing of babies in America. They said that if we would allow abortion on demand, that no child abuse anymore, that every baby would be a wanted baby. When I was a freshman in college, some, something happened in the news. Good Friday, 1982, a baby was born. You might remember the story. His name was Baby Doe. They discovered that he had Down syndrome, which is very close to my family's heart, Libby's heart, because she has a brother who's Down syndrome. And I think if you surveyed our family, you would say the most spiritual one in the whole family is David Stanley. When he was born, he had digestive problems. He could easily be repaired. And amazingly, there was a doctor that specialized in pediatrics just a short distance away, and the doctor said, yeah, that's a possibility, but he said, there's another option. And they said, well, what would that option be? And here's what he said. He said, we have another option. Due to the fact that he will be retarded, th that option is do nothing. We can allow his lungs to fill with liquid, let the digestive juices begin to fill up, because since his esophagus is not connected to the stomach, he will literally drown in his own juices. And the parents agreed to do it. They said after four days, the baby, who had been pushed to the back and allowed to cry, became so incessant and so disturbing to the nurses that they finally took him and put him in a closet. District attorney heard about it. He began to make an appeal. At 1 p.m. on the fifth day of this baby's fighting for its life, he tried to get to the Supreme Court, saying that even a condemned man had a right of appeal before he died. But that little baby died. His heart could take it no more. You know, the shocking thing is, he probably wasn't the first one that died that away, and he certainly hasn't been the last one that died that away in our country. We need to realize that when we say it's okay to kill a baby in the womb, then we are also subconsciously telling people that you can abuse a child, you can, you can uh, take its life so many days later, uh, elderly people, senior citizens, when you get to an age where you know you're not really productive anymore, you're kind of a drain on society. And you know, folks, if I'm not mistaken, during the COVID, I think some of the, those who were put in some very dangerous positions were some of our elderly people in nursing homes in some of the states of our country that really had no real high view of life. You say, where did that start? 1973, when we said babies in the womb were really not human beings. And, it's okay to kill them. 
We must confront the women that are going in for abortions. We must tell them the truth. We must say, do you know that that baby feels pain at eight weeks? Do you know that if you tickle his nose at 37 days that he reacts against it? Do you know that if you sweeten the embryonic fluids, he drinks more? If you make it bitter, he'll drink less? Do you know that his heart is beating at four weeks? We need to tell them the truth. As I close this morning, I want to relate a story that I gleaned many years ago from a fellow pastor, and I want you to hear this story. I want you to hear, because you may say, is that true? Is that a real-life story? I would dare to say that this is happening, as we said, over 4,000 times a day. But listen to the story, October 2nd. Today, my life began. My parents don't know it yet. I'm going to be a girl. I'll have blonde hair and blue eyes. Everything is settled already, even that I will love birds. October the 19th, 17 days. I've grown a little. I'm, I'm still too small to do for myself. Mama does all for me. She doesn't know yet that I'm here. October 23rd. My mouth is beginning to open. In a year or so, I'll be laughing. Later, I'll start to talk, and my first word will be Mama. My heart began to beat. It will beat the rest of my life. 31 days later, November the 2nd. I'm growing legs, and my arms are taking shape. I must wait a long time before these tiny legs hold me up to my mother's arms. November the 12th, 41 days. Fingers are forming on my hand, fingerprints that will never change. One day I'm going to stroke my mother's hair and tell her how nice she is. 49 days, November 20th. T today the doctor told my mother that I was living under her heart. Oh, how happy she must be. November the 26th, 54 days. My mother and father are probably picking out a name. I'm growing so big, I want to live. December the 10th, 68 days. My hair is growing. I wonder what kind of hair my mother has. December the 13th, 71 days. My eyes are almost fully developed, although my lids are still shut. When my mother brings me into the world, it shall be full of sunshine. I've never seen a flower, but more than anything else, I want to see my mother. How do you look, mother? December 24th. My fingers and toes are fully formed. December 26th. I wonder if mama hears my heart beating. My heart's healthy. You have a healthy daughter, mama. December the 28th. Today, my mother killed me. God, forgive us for the babies that have been burnt alive, cut alive. For the things their bodies have been taken and used for, from cosmetics to other things. I tell you folks, I, I, I don't know, we may already be doing it. But it wouldn't surprise me if we don't revert back to some kind of cannibalistic state where we realize, you know what, there's protein in these aborted babies, so we might as well make that available to help people that have health issues. That's where we are, folks. We also need to recognize the millions of women that have procured an abortion. Clement of Alexandria said that women who procure an abortion abort at the same time their human feelings. There are millions of women that have proven that statement true. They suffer the painful, life-disturbing after effects known as post-abortion syndrome. That leads us in closing. What can we do? What can we do? We need to get information out to people. We need to tell teenagers and children and women that are making decisions of this nature. We need to teach them the, about the sanctity of life as they're growing up. We need to teach our young people about there's a God who's sovereign, who is the one who's created and has the only right to determine whether one will live or one will die. We need to get information into the hands of women who have unexpected pregnancies and tell them there's other options. You don't have to kill the baby in the womb. There's other ways. There's adoption. There's other ways to work through this problem. Don't add another problem to an already problem. We can financially support groups like Avenues for Women that, that meet with these women and teach them and show them the options that they have other than abortion. We can pray for ministries like the children's home that takes children who have been neglected and need foster care. We can talk about praying over adopting children and giving them a home uh, that they can grow up in and experience life the way God intended. We can pray for the overturn of the Roe versus Wade decision and pray that that will become a reality. And let me remind you, folks, if we overturn this, and it's possible this could happen this year, it does not mean the end of abortion. It just means that the states themselves now have the authority to decide whether they will allow abortions within their own state borders.
And what you're going to see happening is that the democratic states are going to be more prone to offer abortions, and states that are controlled by Republican leaders are going to be more prone not to procure and allow abortions. Now, if you don't like that, I'm sorry. I want to tell you something about myself. I grew up in a democratic home. My granddad was a staunch Democrat in the state of Arkansas that planned and promoted many things for those that ran for office under the Democratic title. My mother is an 87-year-old staunch Democrat even today. We don't even talk politics. And I still haven't convinced her that she's wrong, okay? We disagree. So I'm coming from a perspective. Let me tell you something, folks. Our allegiance should be more toward the Bible than it is a political party. Amen. We are going to have to come to the reality. We live in a nation. Yeah, we've got a two-party system in America. We have the Democratic Party. We have the Republican Party. And I realize some of you are libertarians. I looked it up. The libertarians believe that abortion should not be something the federal government is involved in, but it ought to be the conscious decision of every person. Well, let me tell you about that. That also is false. Let me tell you about the Republican Party. Yeah, we've had positions, we've had people that mouth with their mouth that they are pro-life, but when they get into office, they do very little for the pro-life cause. They end up nominating people to the Supreme Court that have a very soft view on the abortion issue, and that's why a lot of those folks on the Supreme Court, you'll say, man, they were put there by a Republican president. But they don't stand where we stand on the matter of life. And thank goodness these last three that have been put on there seem to be holding up to what they said they believed about. The, the Republican Party through the years has basically been a party that has said in word that we promote, we promote life, that we are not for abortion. Now, folks, if you're a Democrat like my family was growing up, you need to read the Democrat platform. You need to read what the platform says. I'm not telling you. I'm not making something up. Just Google it. Go online and say, what does the Democratic platform stay, say about abortion? And what they say is, is that they promote and they will do all in their power to provide federal funding and to continue to promote the right of a woman to have abortion. They are saying we will continue to promote that a woman has a right to murder the baby in her womb. Now, folks, that means you as a Christian must decide who is your allegiance to. Is it to a party or is it to a Bible? Is it to a party or is it to the God who creates life? Is the Bible true in what it says about life in the womb or is it not? And this is an issue that ought to take precedence over every issue that is being dealt with in the election cycle. Too many times I see Christians say, well, I know that this candidate uh, believes in abortion, but boy, he's going to really help the economy. No, he's not. The blessings of God will not be on a nation that continues to slaughter the innocent unborn. You can give up that attitude and that idea. And so that means many of us need to take some real heartfelt checks about where we stand and who we vote for and that this is an issue. I tell you, I don't care if the person is a libertarian, a Democrat, or Republican, or whatever else, that if he or she does not believe in the sanctity of life and believes that abortion is a viable option, I don't care if they're running for dog catcher in the city of Owenton or they're running for president in the United States of America, they don't deserve the vote of a Christian. Amen. Final. <laughs> These are the things that we can do. As we close, there may be someone in this audience and you've had an abortion. There may be a man here that encouraged a woman to have an abortion, either, either vocally or through your silence, you encouraged it. You need to come to the Lord and ask God to forgive you. Come and confess it as sin. And the wondrous thing is, He is a God of mercy. You may say, is this a sin that He will not forgive? Oh my, no. He will. He will. He's a God of mercy. If you've been carrying the baggage of a choice that you made many years ago and you've never come to God and just said, Oh God, I'm so sorry. I can't believe that I did that to my baby. Come today and ask for His forgiveness and receive His mercy. He will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. If you're here today and say, Man, I, I'm not a Christian. I may have came on the wrong Sunday 
But the Holy Spirit of God has pricked your heart and caused you to be reminded your life is a miracle. It's a miracle your mother did not abort you. You're living. And God has mercifully been protecting you up to this time. You've not died yet. If you would have died, you would have gone to hell. And you're still alive. Your heart's beating. Your lungs are working. And today you have heard that the God of heaven created you. He made you. Yeah, you came into this world with sin problems. But he loved you so much that he even provided a remedy for that. He sent his son. As Wesley said, who loves children. He loves children. He loves the babies. And he died for you to deal with your sin nature, your sin problem. And you can be saved. You can be forgiven. I want to invite you to come and receive Jesus if you've never been saved. That you will say, I'm a sinner. And I need forgiveness. And God will give you His grace and mercy and forgiveness. Our invitation is just open for you to come. You may feel led to come to pray for our nation. Pray for our Supreme Court that they'll have the boldness and courage to make the decision that will overturn this ungodly, wicked decision that was made 49 years ago. You may need to come to pray for yourself. You may have a friend or family member you need to pray for. And you may need to come and say, Brother Brad, I need to talk to you. I want to be saved. We want to invite you to come. Would you stand as we stand, as we sing? You come and do what the Lord is calling you to do.